that a few hours before we launch into the Daniel fast is not a good time to start a series called Strong Meat. One of our men who will remain nameless, his name rhymes with Steve Baird, he saw the series promo on social media this afternoon and he noted that it contained, quote, beautiful pictures of satisfying, delicious, succulent, juicy meat that we cannot have for the next 30,240 minutes, give or take who's counting. And that brings me to my favorite Daniel Fast picture of all time. The original version by artist Britton Riviere hangs in the Manchester City Art Gallery in England. I may or may not have altered it just slightly to make it a bit more Canadian. That is the moment that Daniel went off his Daniel fast and the lions went on their Daniel fast. And we're beginning tomorrow, as Pastor Jack has said. And and you please do what you want. Some people don't believe it's a fast unless they totally fast everything but water. And that, if that's your conviction, uh, please feel free. You probably might consider uh, doing a shorter fast if you're doing that. Some people have medical issues and they need to modify it slightly. Uh, but if you would do something to unify with your church family and give extra time to the Lord, it would be uh, a blessing to us. Our fourth grandchild little Elena Catherine Hennessy just started on solid foods this week. To say solid would be quite an overstatement because at this point, all of her foods are just mush. But to say she is enjoying them would be quite an understatement because her little mouth just flies open if she even sees a spoon nearby. That's how it is with every baby and with every little creature God has made. <clears throat> and it's that initial instinct of hunger that allows us to grow. And at that stage of our development, milk is the perfect food. Even scripture refers to it. And this will be one of our text scriptures tonight. 1 Peter 2 and 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. I want to talk to you about strong meat tonight. There's a moment for milk. There's a moment for meat. There's a stage for milk and there's a stage for meat. And as we begin this year, we felt led, uh, Pastor Jack was accommodating with the preaching schedule and felt led to kind of wade into this and you'll see where we're going shortly but would you pray one more time and as we're consecrating and committing ourselves afresh and anew at the beginning of this year and at the beginning of a brand new decade I'd like you to just pray very sincerely and very fervently as the Bible says and give God permission to speak to your heart tonight it's wonderful if he speaks to the church corporately but if you go home to your world and he didn't speak to you you've missed the point so would you give God permission to speak to you everybody let's lift up a prayer to God before we begin tonight Lord Jesus I thank you God what a privilege it is to stand in this pulpit what a privilege it is to stand in front of these people and what a privilege it is to know that yet another decade you have led us you have sustained us you have helped us you have been with us God, we've weathered storms and we've suffered losses and we've seen setbacks. We've had hurt and pain and tears and sorrow and sadness. But devil, we are still here and Jesus, you are still glorified. We give you thanks, God, because you have done it. We have come this far by faith, leaning on you, trusting in you and believing in you. I ask that you would anoint me to speak your word in a clear and a pure way. Let it be you and your word and not me and my opinion. Jesus, I pray that you would touch our church and through us you would touch our community and our world. And we give you the praise and the glory. Everybody said in Jesus' name. And you may be seated tonight. 
Peter said it as newborn babes desire, have a desire for that sincere, pure, unadulterated, undiluted milk of the word because that's how you grow when you first come to God. But there does come a point in our lives where we need more than milk. We must graduate to solid food if we're going to continue growing and developing. It is true in the natural realm. Brothers and sisters, it is doubly true, triply true in the spiritual realm. Scripture speaks very clearly, very plainly, and very directly about this transition to maturity by comparing it to eating strong meat, hence the title of our series. And I take you to the book of Hebrews chapter 5. For when for the time you ought to be, you should be teachers, you should be teaching somebody else, but you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You've reverted. You haven't grown. You haven't progressed. You're like a little baby. You've become such as have need of milk. You can't handle strong meat. For everyone that uses milk, here's the comparison, they're unskillful in the word of righteousness. They're like a little baby. And then the writer says, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. They've grown up. They've seen some things. They've weathered some things. But not only that, they're ready to do something for God. They're anxious to be used by God. They are people that are of full age who by reason of use, they haven't just sat around and tried to get it by osmosis, but they have waded into spiritual warfare. By reason of use, use they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice what the Bible says here. There comes a time when you should be teaching others, not needing to be taught the basics over and over and over again. There comes a time when you should be a blessing to others, not needing to be blessed repeatedly over and over again just so you can stay motivated one more week to serve God. There comes a time when you need to trade in your milk for some meat, there comes a moment when you should kiss the bottle goodbye. And yes, one of our ladies, whose name rhymes with Linda Hansen, already noticed that that baby does look a whole lot like Dr. Phil. <laughs> but it's not. There is nothing wrong with a baby being a baby. There is nothing wrong with a new convert being a new convert. But there does come a time when you have to stand up, grow up, and take responsibility for your own spiritual life. The principle is everywhere in the New Testament. It is one of the key components of living a victorious Christian life. And that's why you can hear the frustration in Paul's voice when after him teaching them, after him planting a church, staying in their city for 18 months and writing them letters, he's so frustrated that the Corinthians still don't get it. He said, I, brethren, I couldn't speak unto you as unto spiritual. I can't even talk about spiritual things or on a spiritual level with you. I have to dumb it down and talk to you like carnal people, fleshly people, like babies in Christ. I fed you with milk and I couldn't feed you with meat because up until now, hitherto, you were not able to bear it. And you know what? I look at you and even now I say, you're still not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. Paul is so frustrated. He's not angry. He's not mad. He's not dealing with anger issues. Paul is a man of God. He's a pastor. He's an apostle. He's a missionary. He's a church planner. And he knows how much potential there is in the people of God if they ever just grow up and know who they are and just become what God called them to become. So he's not mad at them. He's mad for them. He wants them to grow up. 
I can't even talk to you on this level because you're still wallowing around down here on this lower level. You're just kind of in a puddle when you could be swimming in the ocean. We've done this before. It's been quite a while, but think about the differences between milk and meat, especially back in Bible times when the apostles had to make their comparison. It's quite significant. And I won't spend a long time here just for comparison. I want to just kind of take you back here. Milk is given to the child by the mother. That's you as a new convert when you come to God. The church, they nurture you and they teach you and they preach to you and they pray for you and they minister to you. And that's your milk days. And you want to just enjoy those days and you want to benefit from those days and you want to be blessed by those days. But there comes a day when you need to graduate to meat. And meat is hunted by and prepared by Yourself. In other words, it's not your church taking responsibility for you serving God. You've grown up and now you take responsibility. If your church burned to the ground and everybody moved out of town and the pastor quit the ministry, you'd still survive because you have taken responsibility. I'm going to serve God and be an apostolic Christian. It doesn't matter who else does or who else doesn't. I'm taking responsibility. Milk is a comfort food. Oh my goodness. You know about babies. What can you do for me today? There's a lot of people live their life that way. What can you do for me? What can you pray for me? How can you bless me? What can you give for me? How can you counsel me? What can you talk to me about? And there's a lot of people and that's fine when you're young and new and you're coming in from a broken world and there's not one person here who has God's good sense that wouldn't want to help a new believer get through all the transitions and the brokenness that they're coming from. There's not one of us that wouldn't want to help. But there comes a day when you need to graduate from milk and you need to start uh, eating some meat. Meat isn't a comfort food. Meat is an energy food. Meat says, what can I do to help you? What can I do to contribute? What can I do to push the church forward? What can I do to push this service forward? What can I do in prayer? What can I do in giving? What can I do to make somebody else's load easier? That's your meat days. Paul said, I'm so frustrated for you, Corinthians, because I like to talk to you as meat eaters, but I have to talk to you as milk drinkers because even now, after all this time, you're still a consumer. You're not a contributor. After all this time, you're still wanting the blessings. You're not wanting to be a blessing. Milk builds up the bones. We all know that scientifically. That's your salvation days. you got to have a salvation experience. And by the way, just because you graduate to meat doesn't mean you never drink any milk anymore. But it just means you've graduated to something better because meat builds up the muscles. And that's your sanctification. That's what you do after. That's how you grow and mature and develop in God. And boy, God's calling some meat eaters in 2020. Some of you are saying, good, because I need some meat the next 21 days. But listen to this. Nothing has to die to produce milk. Somebody said, I can't remember who it was. It might have been C.S. Lewis. He said, when you have your, uh, your milk and your bacon and eggs in the morning for breakfast, he said, the cow and the chicken were involved, but the pig was committed. Nothing has to die to produce milk, but something has to die to produce meat. Can I tell you something about where God's leading you as an individual Christian and where he's leading us as a church? God didn't just kind of get us saved so he could drop us off at the curb and we could all wait for the rapture bus to pick us up some sweet day. God is looking for a church that's interested in doing something that impacts his kingdom. And to do that, some of us, we got to die to some things. You know it personally. You've thought about it over the last few days as you enter this this year. I need to change that. That needs to be better. I need to do more in that area. Don't shut that down. Don't tune that out. Don't white noise that to death. You need to listen to the voice of God. He's calling you higher and deeper and greater and further in 2020. 
And we could go a hundred different directions in this series because there are so many areas where we know we need to grow spiritually. But in preparation for this year and especially for this series, I felt directed to deal with four areas that Jesus dealt with in his famous Sermon on the Mount. In your Bible, that's found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In chapter 5, as the Sermon on the Mount gets started, Jesus gives us a famous passage called the Beatitudes. And then he shows us something that a lot of modern Christians overlook. He shows us how the new covenant of grace will actually demand a much higher standard than the old covenant of law. He says six times in that little passage, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. And every time he takes what the demands of the law were and he lifts them higher and said, the law said this, but I'm demanding more of my disciples. Not less, more. Grace is not a lower law than law. Grace is a higher law than law. And then Jesus moves on, and of course the chapters weren't there in the original. It's just the the summary that Matthew writes of Jesus' sermon. But he moves on in chapter 6 to his expectations for his disciples. And Jesus says it in this form. When you, he's talking to his disciples. In fact, as the Sermon on the Mount opens in chapter 5, he takes his disciples, climbs up a mountain away from everybody else, and he teaches them. One translation, a loose paraphrase of the scripture, uh, it, it says Jesus took his climbing companions. Those that would climb higher with him, he took them and those are the ones that he taught these principles. And in chapter six, Jesus lays out four expectations for his disciples. And it's roughly in this form. When you do this, not if you do it, If you're a disciple, there's no if. My disciples will do this. So when you do this and when you do this. And and, and his expectations are this. Four things we're going to talk about in the four parts of this series. We're going to cover them slightly out of order because obviously I want to talk about fasting tonight because we start tomorrow with a time of commitment for our church. So we'll do them slightly out of order, but here they are in order. Jesus says... I expect my disciples to serve, to pray, to fast, and to give. Now, in in the King James, it's giving alms, but that's serving. It's doing good deeds that impact others. So Jesus said, I expect my disciples to serve, to pray, to fast, and to give. And then finally in chapter 7, If you continue reading, he ends his sermon by warning us, don't you listen to any false prophets that tell you to do other than what I just told you to do. And I would say the same thing to you tonight. Don't you listen to anybody that gives you some discount version of discipleship and says you don't need to really pray all that hard and you don't need to ever fast and you don't need to give or serve. Don't listen to that. That's false teaching. Jesus taught otherwise. The four areas we will cover in this little series, are absolutely critical to your spiritual growth. Please hear me. Please try to hear my heartbeat if you can. Every time I hear about a Christian who has failed or backslidden, I can almost always trace it back to one of these disciplines being missing in their life. And many times... The lack of these disciplines affects their family as well. It shocks me to see such spiritual devastation, massive spiritual devastation, when it just starts out so small. At the beginning, it's maybe just an unwillingness to grow up and take responsibility for their own actions. Or it's just a tendency to blame everybody else for all their difficulties. Or maybe it's just a stubborn streak that refuses to listen to anybody else. Or just a proud heart that thinks their opinion is always right. Or maybe it's just a blind spot that thought none of the rules of serving God applied to them. Or maybe it's just a string of excuses that give them permission in their own mind to be an average, shallow, half-hearted church member. And really all of that is just a refusal to graduate 
from milk to meat. And they bear the consequences in their own life. It is so sad, pathetically sad, and it is so extremely dangerous to the church that these disciplines, serving, praying, fasting, and giving, are almost completely foreign to some modern Pentecostals. That is frightening. Absolutely terrifying. Serving, foreign to them. All they do is show up. Praying, fasting, giving. It's, it's foreign. They, they do token activities. But they don't really do them like Jesus taught them. But brothers and sisters, these are not optional activities for a child of God. Let me get personal. These are not act- optional activities for you If you call yourself a child of God, none of them are optional. Well, pastor, that's pretty strong. Yeah. Strong meat. God's word will correct and direct us. God's word will challenge and discipline us, but only if we will allow it to. Here's the problem. The problem is the longer you've been around the church without doing these things, the more offended you get by any preacher who dares to tell you you should be doing these things. And if you harden your heart long enough, you will convince yourself that you don't have to do any of these things regardless of what any preacher says. But Jesus said, you must do them. Jesus said, he expected you to do them. Seven times in Revelation 2 and 3, God tells us to listen to the voice of the Spirit. I am asking this church, this great church, to please do the same thing as we begin this year. Revelation 3, 23, the last of the seven. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. One of the modern paraphrases of that verse says, Church, are your ears awake? No, it's not talking about those physical appendages on the side of your head. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about your eardrum. It's talking about something far deeper and far more important. Are your ears awake? Can you hear when God talks to you anymore? Strong meat. Yes, since Jesus expected us to fast, and since right now we have such a great opportunity to join the rest of the church in a time of fasting, tonight I want to see what Jesus says about this discipline. Serving, praying, fasting, giving. For a few minutes, let's talk about fasting. In Matthew 6, this is the passage in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, moreover, when you fast, not if you fast, your disciples, you've graduated from milk to meat, so you fast, not if, when. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites of a sad countenance, posting online how hard it is. For they disfigure their faces. Why? Why do they make such drama and trauma out of something like that? that they may appear unto men to fast. Jesus said, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Their reward is the likes on their Facebook post about how hard their time of fasting is. That's their reward. That's the only reward they will get. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face. Why? That you appear not unto men to fast, but unto your Father which is in secret, and your Father who sees what you're doing in secret, he shall reward thee open. Let me say this very clearly, because I think there's a little bit of uh, consternation or even controversy about this. Fasting is any appetite-denying discipline, any appetite-denying discipline that restrains the flesh in order to release God's power in our lives. That's what fasting is. Now, food is the typical one. It normally involves denying ourselves food. That is the major one. That is the typical one. But it could be setting aside 
anything your flesh enjoys. Some people would be far better off to set aside this than to set aside their hamburger. Because that would enable them to not be distracted and focus on prayer. Because the purpose of fasting is not to impress man, and it's not even to impress God. The purpose of fasting is to draw closer to God. So whatever you can do that would let you get closer to God, that's important. Now, fasting is going to be negative for your flesh. Can I get a hearty amen on this eve of the Daniel fast? Fasting is negative for your flesh, but it's positive for your spirit. Fasting intensifies your prayer life and sensitizes you to God's spirit like nothing else in this world. But notice what Jesus said here. Fasting is not some religious performance done to impress God or man. Fasting is something that you do personally and privately. Now, no, no, no. That doesn't mean nobody else can know about it. Israel fasted as a nation, for heaven's sake. It doesn't mean nobody else can know about it. It simply means you don't make a big deal about it. That's it. Because after all, Fasting is something that mature Christians do on a regular basis. Jesus said, get up in the morning, comb your hair, wash your face, carry on. Just go about your normal life even though you're fasting. Give this sacrifice to God in secret. That's what in secret, that's the important part of in secret. Everybody say, no drama. That's the important part of secret, is you just do it unto the Lord. It's not a big deal. Because mature Christians do this. Now let me tell you about the next 21 days. Let me tell you about this time of consecration and commitment we're embarking on. Let me tell you about this thing called fasting. And if you cannot, for a medical reason, do a complete fast, a periodic fast, an intermittent fast, a Daniel fast, whatever. Do something. Just do something. Because here's what Jesus said. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. There are some strongholds that will not fall some sicknesses that will not be healed, some sinners that will not be saved, some backsliders that will not come home, some miracles that will not be seen, some revivals that will not be experienced, some harvests that will not be gathered, some cities that will not be changed, some nations that will not be impacted, some battles that will not be one and some demons that will not budge except by prayer and fasting but with prayer and fasting anything that is possible with God becomes possible for his people Jesus didn't say if you fast he said when you fast <laughs> Luke even mentions the impact of fasting as he records the temptation of Christ in the gospel. This is what fasting did for Jesus. Luke 4 and 2. He was 40 days tempted of the devil. He went 40 days with nothing but water in the desert. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when those 40 days were ended, maybe the most obvious statement in the scripture he afterward hungered, obviously. Why would Jesus do that, especially in the heat of the desert? Why, why, why? Here's why. At the end of those temptations, he came out of the desert. And here's what the, the Bible records in Luke 4, 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. 
the 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness fasting was not a waste of time. It was not a, some kind of trivial spiritual exercise. It was definitely not without purpose. It produced a dimension of power in his ministry that could be gained in no other way and it left a pattern for every one of us who call ourselves his disciples a pattern for us to follow. Look at it. If we want the power of the Spirit, we must pray and fast. We have no problem going to the scripture and saying, Jesus was baptized as an example, so you should be baptized. We have no problem. Well, listen, the same principle is here. Jesus fasted to tell all of his disciples, you need to fast. You need to pray and fast. You need to give yourself to this. If we want the power of the spirit, we must pray and fast. And if we want our region to be impacted by the presence of God, we must pray and fast. <laughs> I watched this afternoon while I was finishing up for tonight. And I watched Pastor Mangan stand in front of POA, that great church. And I heard him say that he's been taking long, long prayer shifts because they had 24-hour prayer in that building since 1972 inside the building but it's the day we live in and so there's a lot of people that are so busy and so they have trouble showing up for their prayer shift and they watch that so closely that if somebody doesn't show up one of the pastors goes in and it's been him he talked about praying a five hour shift I believe he said today because he refuses to let prayer and fasting die in that great church I wasn't born when this great church started. This great church started in 1961, and I didn't come around until a year later. But this church was built on prayer and fasting. This church, our elders, the reason when we get in a prayer meeting and some of them get a little loud and boisterous and they shake a little, and I don't know what you think about that, and I don't care what you think about that there's something so powerful about a church that knows how to reach out and touch God it defies all the religious dead dry nonsense that passes as church today it defies these empty pointless little talks that don't change anybody's eternity and just kind of soothe somebody's conscience it's amazing what prayer and fasting will do but Pentecostals I'm not criticizing anybody else I'm calling all the, the chickens home to roost right now we need to follow in the footsteps of the people that got us this far because if we think we're going to raise up some cool little church with a few screens and a little bit of tech, there's a thousand people in this city that can do technology better than our team, and we've got a good team. There's all kinds of people that can do stuff with more professionalism than we can do, and we've got some great people working at this. But let me tell you something. That is not what changes lives. That couldn't break a drug addiction. That couldn't cure an alcoholic. That couldn't heal a cancer. That can't do any of that. But prayer and fasting can reach up into the heavens and pull down the will of God, the kingdom of God, the power of God, the presence of God, the healing of God. And so we cannot afford to be a church that just kind of applauds the pastor as he gets on one more little rant about prayer. We've got to be a church that says, I am a person that has graduated from milk to meat. I'm going to take some responsibility and I'm I'm not going to let everybody else do this and me slide in on the last service three weeks from now and enjoy it a little bit. No, I'm going to push. I'm going to pull. I'm going to work. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to contribute. Music, come on back. God gave Isaiah a picture 
of the power of fasting. You need to read it, Isaiah 58, because it's not all positive. They were doing this little religious performance and God was not pleased. They were fasting while they were still living like the world. They were fasting for just a religious observance. And God rebuked them and corrected them through the words of the prophet Isaiah. But he also gave us a picture of the power of fasting. He said, I don't like your fast. Your fast is just kind of some religious thing while you keep doing everything you already were doing. He says through Isaiah in verse 6, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? This is the kind of thing that God wants in our fast. Here's what God promises when we fast. To loose the bands of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And to break every yoke. Man, we could use a little bit of that around here. We could use some bands of wickedness being loosed off of people's families. And we could use some heavy burdens being cast down in an altar. And we could use some people that have been oppressed by the enemy for as long as they can remember that they can just go free. And we could use some yokes broken. In fact, we could use some yokes broken. This is a great church. Pastor Jack and I and all the other pastors, we love to teach you and preach to you, but this is a church that knows how to respond to the word and the presence of God. But sometimes, can I just please, pastor, for two seconds, sometimes we just get a little bit lazy and we show up and our webcast, it's so beautiful for people that are sick and recovering at home and, and, and we've got missionaries and oh my goodness, people that watch that all over creation and we're grateful for it but it's made some of us lazy because we've sat at home in our PJs and watched enough church on our computer or our iPad until we act the same when we come back to the building. We just kind of sit there and want to just kind of drink our coffee and eat our sandwich and watch church in the background like background noise. This is not background noise. This is where we connect with God. This is where souls get saved. This is where Christians get challenged. This is is what makes a difference. If you're watching by way of web, I'm not taking a cheap shot at you. We're so thankful you've joined us. But when we're here in this building, we need to do more than just watch. We need to do more than just listen. There's something in the heart of every child of God that has grown up that said, I I'm not just drinking milk. I'm not just a consumer. I'm eating meat. I want to develop some muscles and contribute. I want to go to spiritual warfare with our church. Verse 8. If you'll fast right, if you'll go after me, then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily. My goodness, we need that in several situations in this church. Thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. My goodness, we could use the glory of the Lord to just fall on us in some services, to just fall on us in the middle of a sermon, to just fall on us in the middle of the singing. It gets too old. It gets too normal. It gets too routine and too usual when we know everything that's going to happen. But if we'll pray and fast, you watch God is going to show up in some wonderful ways. Verse 11, and I'm done. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. In other words, if you'll fast... It won't feel dry anymore. You came into 2020 thinking, my goodness, I feel dry in my spirit. Oh, Jesus, something's not right. Something's not on. Something's not there. Something's not with it. Something's not connected. Something's not plugged in. Good, because if that can just steer you toward hunger, then you're going to find your answer. Because if you'll fast, I'll make you like a spring of water. And even in a drought, even even in a dry season, even in a desert. 
it'll just spring up. If I could get you to rise to your feet and stand in authority right now, whatever that means to you, it sure means something to me. It means I refuse to back down. I refuse to sit down, shut down. I refuse to back off or back up. I refuse. I am going after God. I'm not preaching right now. I'm declaring something personal. I am going after God in 2020 like I've never gone after God. I am hungry for God like I've never, I'm not preaching a sermon. I'm just telling you how it is with me. I am so thirsty for God's presence and his power. And all I'm looking for is some people to join me and join Pastor Jack who preached that powerful word about vision this morning. I'm just looking for some people to join me and say, Pastor, we're not sitting there watching you do your thing. We're not sitting there just kind of observing. We're not sitting there waiting to see if it works. No, we're going to get in the trenches with you and we're going to push and we're going to pray and we're going to pull and we're going to fast and we're going to seek God and we are going to see God's glory in CCC and in the city of Fredericton. We will see God's glory. Would you lift up your voice, your voice, your voice, your voice, your voice, your voice. Would you just lift up your voice? Oh. Oh. I am not going to let somebody else carry me. I'm going to help carry my church. I am not going to let somebody else carry my family. We're going to help carry this church. Oh, just reach out after God. Just reach out after God. Just reach out after God. There's a call in here tonight. There's a call in here. God's calling you to prayer and fasting. God's calling you to prayer and fasting. You don't have to be intensely spiritual to just pray and fast. You can just do it in the way you do it. You don't have to be some superstar to pray and fast. You just do it in the way you do it. But do something. But do something. When you pray, when you fast, when you pray, when you fast. I'm coming back, Jesus. I've been straying. I've been playing, but I'm, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I want you to get in your mind, in your heart, and in your spirit. I want you to get something that you want to see God do in the next 21 days. Please don't do something generic because then you won't know if it ever happened. Oh, I want to have good church. No, that's, that's, that's not a good prayer. You wouldn't know if that happened or not. Something specific. Something that matters. Something that impacts eternity. You got it? Has it been so long that you're not really even asking God for anything? Because you're just going through the motions spiritually. You can't even think of anything to ask God for because you're just going through the motions. If so, you need to shake yourself. Because if you'll pray and fast, God will hear. 
So what's that name? Who's that person? What's that family member? What's that situation? What's that sickness? What's that miracle that's needed? I'm not stopping because I got nothing to say. I'm stopping for you to hook in and connect and, 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 and get there. And now I want you to lift up your hands. But just as if spiritually you were lifting up a doubled fist and saying, now, God, I'm coming after this. Just like Jacob, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm not going to let you go, God, until you hear me. I'm not going to let you go until I see this. I'm not going to let you go until you do this. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to nag you, God. I'm going to talk to you, God. You're going to hear from me, God. Every day you're going to hear from me, God. I need this. I need this in my life. I need this in my family. I need this in my home. I need this for my future. I need this, God. You're going to hear from me, God. Oh, my. There's something that just seized a hold of somebody there. And for many of you, it's a person, it's a name. And I just need you to keep praying for a moment. That person, that name. And now I want you to turn around, not meekly, not reluctantly, not with embarrassment. I want you to turn around and with authority and prayer, I want you to reach out to somebody else. You don't have to tell them what you're praying for. I just want you to pray with them that both of your requests or all three of your requests, whoever you're with, God, hear our prayer. God, hear our prayer. That's all we need to pray right now. God, hear our prayer. You're going to hear from us. We want to hear from you. You're going to hear from us. We want to hear from you. God, you're going to hear from us. So we want to hear from you you can be expecting to hear from us so God we are expecting to hear from you oh if you've never fasted before now's the time if you've never fasted before this is your season try something new try something different yes god yes jesus yes jesus Oh, receive it, receive it. There's a confirmation for you tonight. There's an anointing for you. There's a prayer anointing coming on somebody right now. We need it, Jesus. We want it, Jesus. We're hungry for it. We're thirsty for it. We can't live without it. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. God, call our young men to fasting and prayer. God, call our young ladies to fasting and prayer. God, call our families to fasting and prayer. Our seniors to fasting and prayer. Our singles to fasting and prayer. Even our children, God, to fasting and prayer. Yes, God. Yes, <laughs> God.
Just back to you now. Would you lift your hands, lift your head, lift your voice and declare into the heavens what you're expecting to see from the Lord, from the hand of the Lord. This is not an act of foolishness. This is an act of faith. This is not an act of recklessness. This is an act of dependence on God. God, we're expecting it. We declare it. We decree it. We will see it. Oh yeah, time to shake yourself, saint of God. Strong meat, strong meat. We are strong, we are strong. I worship you, God. Jesus, I thank you for the challenge of your word in our services today. And I thank you for the receptivity of your people in our services today. We need you to show up in your glory and change everything and change everyone. Surre bia korya baha. Sundre ba leto koshesa. Subia reba loto ko yahesya sa. Oh, oh, ya betere mo shekia baha. Super eba bia toko la baha. Sunderebe, bieto correhesia. Yes, Jesus. If you would let that out as an act of faith, that would be a wonderful thing. And I believe God would respond to you personally. You know who you are and what you're feeling. If you would let that out as an act of faith, let it out through your hands, through your voice, through your praise, through your words, through your tears. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Erebo siasabo koya baha. Oh, 